is trying to get in and she can't seem to get in. If she's trying to join as an attendee, she should be able to join now because I just began the broadcast. Okay. And that's uh, where Margaret, I, yep, they're there. They're there now? Yep. Yeah. Well, lots of, lots of attendees today. Are we ready? Yes. Okay, um, seeing as we have a quorum of the council, I am calling the special town council meeting um, of the joint town council and town services and outreach committee meeting on May 4th, 2020 at 9.30 a.m. to order. And um, I am Darcy Dumont and I'm calling the May 4th, 2020 meeting of the town Amherst town service and outreach committee to order at 9.33. Um, Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law allows us to hold this virtual meeting of the TSO committee. I'll call upon each committee member by name. At this time, I'll confirm that you can hear me and we can hear you. Please remember to mute your mic after saying present. Alyssa Brewer. Alyssa? Yeah, I'm here. These windows on this machine are just lovely, aren't they? Present. Okay, okay I'm here. Dorothy Pam? Here. Kevin Ross? Here. George Ryan? I'm present. Do you and want? I, I'll, I'll do the three counselors, the other counselors that are present. Myself, Mandy Johanneke is here. Kathy Shane? Present. And Pat DeAngelis? Present. Okay. So committee members, there's no chat room uh, for this meeting. If you have technical issues, please let staff know. To make a comment or ask a question, please click the raised hand button. If technical difficulties arise, we'll address the situation. Discussion may be suspended while we address technical issues and the minutes will note if a disconnection occurred. Those assisting the meeting will be monitoring committee member connections and if necessary, we'll pause the meeting until you're reconnected. This is all just to let the viewing public know uh, that we're still working out the bugs of meeting in the era of Zoom and to request that everyone be patient with the process. So we're moving on to public comment. The public may provide public comment at this time on matters within the jurisdiction of the Town Services and Outreach Committee. Residents are welcome to express their views for up to three minutes. Counselors will not respond to questions or engage in a dialogue during the public comment. This is the public's time to speak. To participate in public comment, see instructions at the bottom of the agenda. If you join the council meeting via Zoom con teleconferencing, to indicate you wish to make a comment, click on participants and then click on raise hand. If you join the council meeting via telephone to indicate you wish to make a comment, press star nine on your telephone. The chair will recognize members of the public at this time who wish to speak. And when called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address. So I will look at who is here. Um, attendees. Okay, I have one person raising his hand. I'll start with Rick last. Can we hear Rick? I'm unmute myself. Am I unmuted? Yes, there we go. All Great. Right. Good. Right. And, um, I, just I just saw that like Max was here and not here, and that same thing happened to me. I just wanted to, you know, let the public comment people know that you kind of disappear because you do something with that. Is is that correct? Um. So I I can answer that, Darcy. Sure. You we we dem, we put you on the attendee side instead of the panelist side. Um. But this is the appropriate time for the public comments for um, wage theft. Yeah, no, I was just worrying that uh, people were uh, here and then they disappear and feel they, like- They are still here. attending. Okay, good. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for inviting me here. 
My name's Rick Lass, 590 Middle Street, Amherst. I've been a resident of Amherst for 25 years and a former teacher and district mentor teacher in the Amherst schools. I also volunteer with the Pioneer Valley Workers Center fighting for the rights of low wage and immigrant workers. Some may think it's a strange time to look at wage theft issue when over a million people in the U.S. are infected with COVID-19. Nearly 70,000 have died. 22 million people are unemployed. And our most vulnerable population is facing devastating food, housing, and economic insecurity. Many workers are faced with no choice but to risk their health and lives to go to work. So there actually is no better time to think about a world that protects vulnerable workers. So many have faced exploitation at their jobs. We must have structures in place to protect them. For low wage workers especially, if their wages are stolen, it means their families may struggle to pay the rent, put food on the table, buy school supplies, or pay for, medi or pay for medication. Wage theft is a growing issue. It affects many industries, but is especially prevalent in construction and service industries and happens in many ways. Workers in construction may be misclassified as independent contractors. Some workers are paid in cash, denied overtime, and paid in lumps, lump sums regardless of how many hours they've worked. This has an effect not only on workers, but also on honest businesses that can't compete with those who are not playing by the rules. It actually robs the community of significant tax revenue. In the construction industry, companies that break the law get an unfair economic advantage and undercut law-abiding businesses. We need to consider as a community how we hold businesses accountable when they break the law. How will we make it clear that when, they, uh, that when you run a business or do construction in Amherst, fairness is not negotiable? A study of nearly 4,500 low-wage workers by the National Employment Law Project found that over two-thirds of them have experienced wage theft and employers stole more than $56 million uh, in workers' wages every week. Research published by the University of Massachusetts Amherst asserts that, quote, the illegal theft of workers' wages, especially those of undocumented immigrant laborers, have reached ep ep epidemic levels in the construction industry in Massachusetts. Our town needs bylaws and ordinances that give Amherst officials oversight to assure that labor laws are being followed and workers are being paid the wages they earn. Let's follow in the footsteps of Northampton, East Hampton, Springfield, who guarantee such rights. I support the bylaws that not only have consequences for those who do not comply, but also include vetting of all new businesses and constructions to assure past compliance. We should not be using public funds or granting business licenses to companies with a history of wage theft abuse. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Um, okay, we also have Max Page. Go ahead, Max. Can you hear me? Yes, can yes. you hear me? Yes. Uh -huh. Good, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, so my name is Max Page. I live at 84 McClellan Street. I teach at UMass. And I'm the vice president of the Massachusetts uh, Teachers Association, which is the union of 117,000 educators across the state. And I'm glad to speak to you this morning about the wage theft bylaw proposal. So just very few points I'd like to make um, to uh, on this issue. This on, on one very simple level, this bylaw matches our town's values. Making sure working people are paid fairly is a part of a core set of beliefs I think we all share in this community. And this bylaw gives working people underpaid, usually without a union, many of whom have come to our community from somewhere else, another level of power to protect themselves and their coworkers from exploitation. And the bylaw simply supports the spirit and letter of state wage laws and helps the promise of wage justice real. The attorney general's offices have been quite clear they cannot do it alone. And they've asked cities and towns to let them, to join them in this effort. And as Rick said, our neighbors, Northampton, East Hampton, Springfield, not to mention Boston and New Bedford and Cambridge, so on, have all done this. We are not in reinventing the wheel. This proposal is not asking you to reinvent the wheel, but rather to simply um, the join, join the march for, for wage justice. And I just wanna say something really clear. The bylaw is good for business. The vast majority of Amherst business owners follow the law and are good employer, employers. 
why should they have to compete against those who skirt or outright violate the state's wage laws? This is really, again, not an attack on Amherst business. Rather, it is a protector of those who do right by their employees. And then finally, um, the question I know many are asking is why now? I mean, here we are conducting the town's business by Zoom. I grew up here and certainly never imagined that I would be uh, participating in a public comment over my computer when I'm about you know, a few hundred yards from, from town hall. So the question is, like, can't we push this down the road? Isn't this something for another day, not so important? And I, I wanna really emphasize first is we all, I think, have a greater appreciation of the role of regular hourly working people and the role they play in the society. Um, if our grocery store workers, gas station attendants, sanitation workers, restaurant workers, warehouse workers, nurses aides walked away, everything would truly collapse. So this bylaw, um, which helps to guarantee that even though these wages are probably not as high as we would like them to be, then at least they get paid what they are owed. And it's just one another way to honor their service in really holding the society um, together. And um, finally, I just want you to think about it this way also. This is the way we've been talking in the Mass Teachers Association as well. We shouldn't see this moment, this crisis, as just a time where we stop the disease and quote unquote, get back to normal but rather where we have taken a new look at our values and realign our town's bylaws toward greater justice. So look forward, um, not backward, like let's just get back to where we were, but rather let's take the terrible moment and make the changes we need so that we are stronger and a more just community after we are done. So I urge you to pass this wage theft bylaw and um, make our town even stronger. Thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, we have one more person who has a hand up who is a phone number. Um, so uh, if you could um, identify yourself and give your address, then you can make your statement. Great, thanks. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. So good morning, everyone. My name is Jasmine Kerasi, and I live at 81 Harlow Drive. I work at UMass and I'm a faculty member there in the sociology department in the labor center. And I wanted to speak with you today because I'd like to share some of our recent research on work in this time of coronavirus. And I think our work, it really shows how important it is to protect workers right now, especially low wage workers who are most vulnerable to wage theft. So from April 17th to April 24th, my colleague Claire Hammonds and I conducted a survey of essential workers here in Western Massachusetts. The survey sought to understand safety measures and the food, housing, and child care security for essential workers during this pandemic. We reached potential respondents through Facebook advertisements targeted to residents of Western Mass and invited them to take a survey. And we got 1,600 responses. And they were across a wide range of industries, including food service, grocery, logistics, and health. And the findings show just how dire the situation is for so many low wage workers right now during coronavirus. Um, and I wanna highlight three particular findings. And um, they're about low wage workers, which we defined as earning under $20 an hour. So the first important finding is that low wage workers were two to three times more likely than high wage workers to lack access to basic safety measures, including masks, hand sanitizers, hand washing, and training on COVID-19 transmission. The second is that large numbers of low wage workers reported that just in the last week, they were unable to meet their family's food needs, 34%, housing needs, 9%, and childcare needs, 16%. And third, the qualitative component of the survey indicated that these workers were fairly scared. Yes, they were concerned about their exposure to coronavirus, of course, but they were also scared about losing their jobs. And several pleaded that we not tell their employers that they answered the survey, worried that speaking about their very basic, basic safety issues would cost them their jobs. They're already on the financial edge and they were worried that speaking up um, would push them over. So as a labor scholar, I'm concerned that the pandemic will further silence the voices of workers, including around issues of wage theft. And so I think that Amherst, um, one step towards supporting these low wage workers is to pass these bylaws and ordinances that give Amherst officials oversight 
to assure that labor laws are being followed and workers are being paid. And this is really the right time to do that. Um, so the research that I've been doing really shows that the coronavirus has exacerbated the desperate situation that low wage workers already face. And I hope that we can be proactive in making sure that we do what we can um, to prevent wage theft during this difficult time. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I would just like to say that if um, people who gave public comment today have their comments in writing, um, they can forward them to the clerk to, to add to the record. Um, so, okay, thank you. We're going to move on now. Um, we have one uh, action item before we get into the, the wage theft presentation and discussion. Um, we're going to be just taking out briefly one um, town manager appointment. So, um, we're uh, considering the town manager's recommendation for appointment of Sarah Swartz to ECAC. So, um, this requires a little tiny bit of explanation. Um, the charge for the Energy and Climate Action Committee calls for committees to have the committee to have nine voting members, two current town councilors, and seven residents. Um, there is a vacancy due to the resignation of a town councilor, and thus a town councilor has to fill that seat. So as per the council rules, the president of the council polled the council to see who would like to serve on the ECAC, and Sarah Swartz responded. So at its meeting on April 27th, 2020, the town council voted unanimously to recommend to the town manager that he appoint Councillor Sarah Swartz to the Energy and Climate Action Committee. And that's what we have in front of us today. Thus, um, I move to recommend that the town council approve the town manager's recommendation to appoint Sarah Swartz to ECAC for a term expiring on January 3rd, 2022. Do I have a second? Second. I think the second has to come from this committee. Yeah, I do. So I'll, I think I'll second. Okay. <laughs> and then I want to also give a comment. Okay, go ahead, Evan. I um, raised my hand. I want to know the etiquette. Do we raise hands, the members of the committee, or do we um, act in a more normal way? I had raised my hand, but I realize you might not even be able to see my raised hand. Right. I I am now looking at the raised hands, which of which I could go like this. I think this works better. But um, I'm fine with either way. Um, but um, anyway, Evan seconded it. And um, comments, Evan. Yeah. So. Um this is uh, the town manager's second somewhat recent appointment to ECAC um, after there was a vacancy that was filled a few months ago. And that vacancy was to replace uh, Nikki Robb, uh, who is a, a resident member who had resigned. Um, and she was a farmer and had a lot of experience um, with agriculture and, and the committee felt that was really useful. Um, and when she stepped off of the committee and when in our former role as Oka was reviewing uh, the recent town manager appointment. I had sort of pressed the town manager on um, the fact that his appointment to fill that vacancy didn't necessarily fill the vacancy left by uh, someone who um, had an understanding of agriculture and how that ties into the mission of ECAC. Um, and so I had obviously supported his last appointment, but, but sort of pushed back on the idea that we weren't necessarily filling um, those skills. And so I was actually really excited that Sarah stepped up um, because I had previously pressed on the idea that agriculture was not represented on this committee, even though it had been. And so um, even though uh, this was more someone stepping up than the town manager going out, I am really excited um, to see that Sarah stepping into this role because it, it fits it's something that, that we had, that OCA had had discussions with the town manager before of something that was missing on this community. So I'm really excited and thank you so much, Sarah. Other comments? Um, I, would, I would also uh, second Evan's um, excitement about having Sarah on the Energy and Climate Action Committee. I'm the other counselor on the Energy and Climate Action Committee and I'm 
And we do have a, 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 a scarcity of, of experts with regard to, to agricultural carbon emissions. So we're, we're really happy. Uh, we're going to hopefully be happy to have Sarah on board. And I did look at the expiration date. I wondered about that for a minute, but I, the expiration date is clearly in line with the end of our first term as counselors. I'm assuming that's why the term ends on January 3rd, 2022. Um, so um, all those in, any other comments? All those in favor? Uh, roll call Alyssa Brewer. Hi. Uh, is it I'm, not registering? No, it is. Uh, and uh, I vote yes. Dorothy? Yes. Evan Ross? Yes. George Ryan? Yes. Okay, it's unanimous. So we'll be sending that to the town council and we'll be acting on it tonight. Um, okay, so moving on to the presentation and discussion items. The first item on the agenda is the wage theft presentation and discussion. At our last meeting, we had an initial presentation and discussion of the wage theft bylaw issue. Uh, I put it on the agenda as our first item because uh, um, one of our colleagues suggested that it had a strong connection to COVID-19 and protecting low wage earners in Amherst. And our presenters heard the comments made by the counselors last week and will be presenting an update and further clarification of their proposal. So the co-sponsors with, are with us again today are uh, Pat DeAngelis, Mandy Jo Haneke, and Kathy Shane, and three advocates um, who are um, going to be participants, I believe. Um, Margaret Sawyer and Rose Bookbinder are with the Pioneer Valley Workers Center, and Lisa Clausen is with the Carpenters Union. And we're going to start with a presentation by Councillor Kathy Shane, and after the presentation, we'll again open up to discussions and questions. So, what would you like to have? What document would you like to have up first, Kathy? Um, Alyssa, uh, Darcy, I see that Alyssa is raising her hand. Oh, okay, Alyssa. Unmute. Yep. And, and I was actually doing it the way we've been taught to, Dorothy, which is that we're supposed to do the raise hand button. So at any rate, um, just to add a little more clarity to this, I appreciate what, you, what you've already gone over, Darcy, about where we are. We had our first presentation on this on April 21st. None of the rest of the TSO members, or at least certainly I didn't, knew that the presentation was coming to that meeting. We didn't know that three counselors were coming. We didn't know that the advocates were coming, so we couldn't ask questions ahead of time. And then we asked questions on the 21st, which didn't get answered until Saturday night, as in like 48 hours ago, less than. So we may not be as fully cognizant of the details as perhaps even some of the public is on some of these details because we haven't had that information. So I'm sure this will be very informative to us and we're all doing the best we can under the circumstances, but this is not normally how we try and proceed through our process. So I appreciate everyone being here today and watching us stumble through it. Go ahead, Kathy. Do okay. Okay. Uh, on Alyssa, I completely agree with you that we were not as timely as we should have been. Um, and that was actually just probably more on my shoulders than anybody else, because I got the drafts done and then we didn't get them forward. But what we'd like to do today is um, respond to some excellent comments and questions that we got last week, uh, two weeks ago. And I d we didn't see this as a final conversation, as Mandy will say. Mandy's going to talk after I talk um, on some additional thoughts we have on potential revisions. So um, 
we're responding with four documents that we sent you. Um, in particular, the first one that Mandy has just put up on the screen does a comparison of what is currently on our books for responsible employers for construction contracts construction projects where there's public money involved. But I want to remind everyone as we go through this, this is a set of three um, that would basically strengthen Amherst's ability to ensure that any public funds, whether they're going out to a contractor or going out with tax relief or going out with a grant or any licensure, go to employers that comply with the law. And if there are violations and allows the town to use its power as a contractor, as a licensure and other authority to penalize employers that do not comply with the law. So this is about wage justice and protecting the workers who are working on projects that have public money, whether it's tax relief or direct construction or receive a license. So to just, I'm, you, you got the four documents and um, we're gonna be happy to take any questions on them. And I'm just gonna start with this first one because we have a um, uh, responsible employer bylaw on the books. So I'm gonna highlight only places that I think it's important to focus on what this, and this would be a complete replacement of that. So not, uh, not just rewording. So I've indicated on this side by side where the wording is the same and where it adds words. As Mandy noted a couple weeks ago when we first discussed this, one of the key areas on responsible employers that right at the beginning of any contract, we are asking for contractors who are bidders on a construction project to certify in writing that they are not in violation of state laws. And then we would also put that certification into any contract language that if they violate laws, they're subject to penalties, including loss of the contract. So this certify in writing that they have not been in violation of the law in the past, and then putting it into contract language that going forward, they will not be in violation are key additions in this bylaw. Um, Mandy, you can go to the next page on it. Um, the penalties for failing to comply, um, three of them are exactly the same as we have currently on the books. And a fourth has a variation in the currently on the books. The fourth is any other remedy available by law or inequity. And we've added a fourth that used to be, before we revised this law, um, liquidated damages. Um, we, um, and reviewing this, we could certainly live with the current law language or we could have a fifth because the current law language is broader. This fourth allowed a specific an assessment of damages. And again, all of these um, potential penalties are an option. The town could do one or some of these, so it allows enforcement. Um, the additional wording that was added in other places is adds definitions of what a contractor is, a subcontractor is, requires um, a focus on success, successor contractors. So same people um, change the name of the firm, but are the new owners of the firm, they still carry with them any history of violations um, from the past. So we, we've added definitions. Um, Mandy, next uh, side by side. And we've been more specific uh, in what, what kind of past history we want to be looking at in the past. So th this is, again, what they're agreeing in writing, but what kind of past history we want to look back at. So we added specifics. And this was drawn from several other municipalities and towns that have this kind of uh, violation that what we consider a violation. So there's a long list of these that are been putting in. And as you can see, these are all in addition that there's not something similar in this current law. Okay, I think you can go to the next slide on here. The other, the other main 
addition on it is that we've added demographics um, that to the extent possible an employer should be trying to hire um, vulnerable populations that are often not in the construction industry, minorities and women. So we've added this demographics. And when, you, when we look at the tax um, incentive bylaw and what we've done to that, this same language on demographics is in that. So this is a, an attempt to use our contracting ability and our tax, uh, tax incentives to get more diversity in the construction industry that people, particularly for people that have often been barred in the past. So it has specifics on what laws we're trying to enforce as well as these demographics. So I think that's all I'm going to say on the side by side. And, and again, all of us are available for questions. And I don't know, Dorsey, if you want me to go through each of these and take questions at the end or whether we should do the set of three and then take questions about the group. Well, I, I've set aside just until uh, about 1030 for this whole discussion. So whatever you can fit in, as long as we have time for, um, we're I'm, well, hoping to okay. end by 1015 or so, so that we can have time for questions. Um, okay. I, so I can go quickly through the other two if you want to, and then just take. Sure questions, um, recognizing Alyssa's plea that they've, you've only had 48 hours to look at these documents. So, so the second bylaw, and this is again a set of three, is the tax relief bylaw. And you'll see when you do the comparison with the responsible employer and construction contract that the same language of definitions is in there, the same um, wording around demographics. So in this case, the enforcement is around the tax increment financing where we've given an incentive to a private developer. So this is not a public construction project, but we've given it to a developer for affordable housing or other reasons we use the tax increment financing. And this, in this case, the remedies, if there are past violations or current violations. Again, it would be in writing that they would have to certify that they haven't been in violation in the past. If they we encounter violations, the tax relief money that they've had on the books would be at risk. And this could be either entirely clawed back or partially clawed back. And it would also hold the main contractor, the main developer and project manager accountable for any subcontracts or any successor contracts. So this is taking the public construction contract wording in terms of definitions and now saying we're also uh, adding enforcement around a private project that got a tax incentive. Okay, going to the next set. On the wage and tip, tip proposed by law, this is the third of the set of three. This one is focused um, steps beyond just the construction industry or the tax incentive to also go to entities that get licensed, particularly restaurant service industries, where there is a, there are often a lot of violations around tips, around wages, around paydays, and how people are paid. So as a companion, it's spreading to a broader set of industries because we're also invoking the power of our licensure to be an enforcement and incentive to comply with the law. Um, the target industries are not specified in this because it would apply more broadly, but it would be specifically spreading to the service and hospitality, restaurants, bars, hotels, any place employees get tips. Um, the specific additions that it's, it's put in, um, we don't have anything like this on our books, is the first thing I want to say. So the specific provisions that have been put in are that, um, first of all, people would be told what their rights are, and they'd be told it in writing, and it would be posted in a prominent place. It would ask people who are getting a license to look backwards had they been in violation, so they might not even get a license in the town if they've been violation. They would put, potentially put their license at risk, but they would also potentially have to put a wage bond that would protect against future um, 
violations and put up money. The other addition in this specific bylaw that received a lot of questions last time by the committee, and I'm gonna have Mandy talk about this um, after I finish in one minute, is the Wage Theft Advisory Committee. We've set this bylaw would set up a formation of a committee that would be um, an adjunct to the town where the town would actually be the enforcer in all of this, investigate and explore, and everything would be done through the attorney general, which would be the entity that finds a violation. The Wage Theft Advisory Committee would collect um, over time what has happened and do annual reports and serve as a potential route for people first to complain or to cite a violation to get to the procurement officer in Amherst if it's on a public contract or on a tax relief or to the licensure board that there may be a violation. Um, so I'm going to stop there um, uh, in terms of enforcement um, at the ending here because the addition that this bylaw brings is you potentially lose your license or have to put up a wage bond. So again, the set of three is an effort to allow Amherst to enforce state laws through our own authority. Mandy, you want to pick up? Yes. So. Um a couple of things. We're not quite ready to um, present a modified bylaw, but we heard your comments from last meeting and we're working on modifying the enforcement violations and penalties section of the wage and tip theft bylaw um, to specifically remove the wage theft advisory committee from sort of the enforcement part of that and make it more clear that that advisory committee is really a reporting committee and sort of a, a committee that will receive complaints wherever they might have been received in town, that, that there'll be a sort of central processing, simply for the point of if, you know, the procurement officer receives a complaint, but it's on something that might relate to the Board of License, it comes to the wage theft advisory committee for the purpose of being able to report out numbers of complaints in their annual reporting, but also then the Wage Theft Advisory Committee would be required to tell the Board of License Commission um, about, and the Attorney General's Office about that complaint, um, but they're not gonna be doing any investigation. We don't have language for that yet. Um, so we're, we're working on that, but we wanted to let you guys know that we're, we're cognizant of the concerns and we're going to try and respond to that with some modified language. Um, and the other item, um, I think that we were going to talk about or discuss um, is that as, as Kathy said, the tax incentive um, bylaw and the responsible employer bylaw have a number of duplicate provisions because they're very similar. And so we wanted some advice on many towns have them in the same bylaw. We proposed them in two different bylaws that then required a lot of duplication. Um, and we'd like um, the committee's thoughts on whether to combine them back into one so that this would be a set of two separate bylaws instead of three separate bylaws. And then the only other thing I wanted to say um, about wage and tip theft is while this bylaw technically applies to all employers in town, um, it is, it is sort of geared towards the hospitality and retail industry, but all employers in town, the way this is written, would have to do the posting requirements. Um, and I just wanted to make that clear. Um, so construction employers, um, any other employers would have those posting requirements. Most state and federal laws require some sort of posting requirements for other things. So this would just be added to all those posting requirements. Okay, is that, um, is that it as far as the presentation? Yes. Um, okay, well, I want to thank the, this group of uh, um, counselors and advocates for the amount of work that you've put into this. Um, and I'm going to open this up now to um, counselors for questions and discussion. Evan. Yeah, so first of all, I want to echo Darcy's thank you. Um, the amount of time it has taken me to 
read and reread the bylaws uh, to try to understand <laughs> what's happening considering this is out of my wheelhouse only has given me greater respect for those of you who actually worked on writing these bylaws because um, reading them is taking me so long I can't imagine the months of work it took writing them. Um, so I had a, a couple questions um, or in some places I just need clarifications in some cases there's, there's a couple things that made me a little uncomfortable that I'm just sort of curious about and I don't know if you want me to just run through all of them. Um, most of them are on the, the third bylaw, the wage and tip theft one. Um, so I don't yeah. know if you want to treat these separately, but um, so responsible employer, I just want to, so, um, and Pat knows this and Alyssa knows this because we were on bylaw review. One of the reasons we did what we did for the responsible employer, if I remember correctly, was a lot of it was just listing, follow this state law, follow this state law, follow this state law. And we were kind of like, well, if our bylaw is just saying follow state law, do we really need that? It, my, my sense was it looked like you added that all back in because you added another layer that they have to do it in writing, which isn't otherwise required. And so I just want to clarify that that was the intent of adding that back in, was that that written acknowledgement? Absolutely, Evan. And it's because they have to acknowledge it in writing, it's a good exercise to have them know what they're acknowledging, that the employer themselves may not know, oh, that these are required in the state law. So it brings the attention back to the content of the state law rather than listed as MGL blank, blank, blank. It says, look, this is what's in that law. Okay, great. Uh, and then the, the second question I had on responsible employer, and I think this also is the, the tip thing too, um, was that you had um, certain threshold percentages for different demographics, and I just wasn't sure where those numbers, if you came up with those, or if those are sort of standard practice, if those are law in some case, I just wasn't sure where those numbers were from. So I think I can answer that one. Um, they we actually took the state law numbers there's a state law with construction contract demographics and and we did not increase those numbers at all we just accepted those state law numbers instead of attempting to come up with our own okay that was an could, exact question um could, add, could i just add i'm sorry I, I don't seem to find the hand raise thing for my piece but just to add on that it's not a law a state law with the diversity requirements it's an executive order that um, got passed by um, Deval Patrick and is still in effect um, uh, that has those as um, uh, goals for any um, state funding that goes into projects. And so just as an example, all of the UMass projects um, as a result are have those numbers and are meeting them. Um, that's for women and people of color. Um, the veterans piece is not a part of the state executive order, but it's just been a practice that different other cities and towns that have started addressing this issue have added um, to um, uh, the casinos first did it um, through the gaming commission and then other cities and towns as they've taken up this issue have also added it in. Thank you. Um, and then just in response to Kathy, or maybe it was Mandy's, sorry. Um, the duplication thing is I, I was also wondering if there was some way to write into the responsible employer bylaw. These provisions also affect bylaw so and so, but I, I don't know. I hadn't thought that through that much, but it did, it did strike me. I was like, oh, this is very similar. I wonder if there's a way not to combine the two, but maybe just to cross reference or something. Um, on the wage tip, it, the wage, uh, and tip theft uh, advisory one. So a, a couple things um, that having thought about these uh, sort of stood out to me. So one was with regard to the committee itself. Um, so every member of the committee is a representative from another organization. Um, and in some ways, I think that's a good thing. In some ways, I was also sort of thinking there's always some risk in involving um, in, in mandating in the bylaw that it has to be an organization, because in theory, if an organization folds, hopefully it doesn't, but let's say the chamber folds, um, then all of a sudden you have to revise the bylaw. I know Darcy and I dealt with this when we were doing ECAC, there was some conversation of, should we put like one member from others out front? And we kind of said, yeah, you know, it might not make sense to mandate certain organization representation as opposed to just saying, you know, residents who have a legal expertise or, or worker, you know, something like that. And so just sort of curious about that. Um, I still remain a little bit uncomfortable with the idea that the committee itself can receive complaints. I was told last time 
that most of the things would go to the AG and then down to the committee, but the committee could also receive complaints. And, and I do have some concerns about, you know, Joe, Joe Snow on this committee is able to have any worker sort of give that person a complaint and then they bring it to the committee. And so just sort of um, curious how that works. Those are my only two. And then my third thing on the committee as a whole, and then I'll, I'll shut up on the committee, though I have a couple other things, um, is just, you know, this town loves to form committees. Um, and so I, I guess if the committee's sole purpose is just reporting, is it, is there a benefit to having a committee if it seems like it's sort of whole purpose is just to report numbers? Is there a, a way to do that? So uh, I'll step aside for now. Rose has her hand up. Go ahead, Rose. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm not sure, you know, Evan or other folks, if you've, you know, worked in low wage jobs um, and just, yeah, great. So I think you probably know like the alienation that occurs when you, um, are living in the shadows or not feeling comfortable to, um, you know, talk or approach very bureaucratic systems like the attorney general's office. But um, part of the reason why we, we brainstormed and modeled after other advisory boards was pulling in people to local government who have relationships with these communities and will be a space where workers um, can feel like they can come. And these processes are very, you know, bureaucratic and scary. And so if there's a place where they can come and have a group of community members and organizations to say, okay, this is the process that you would go through. Um, we're here for you if you have questions. Um, I don't think it's just like for the sake of creating a committee, but it's to make sure that this law doesn't just sit on the books and isn't actually doing what it's supposed to, because the reality is, is the unfortunate thing is really is that we are having to even create these laws because the laws already exist. The reason we're creating them is because they're not enforced and workers are afraid to speak up to share the fact that they're having these laws um, not followed. So the point of the committee is not just to have, you know, a lawyer or these folks that are, are disconnected from the base, but to have organizations that have real community and real um, and, and, you know, a sense of safety for these workers to, to come. Um, and I think that, you know, another really valuable aspect of it is that um, it creates like a, a vision in the moment, but also in the future for like monitoring, monitoring all these things. Otherwise, it's just like, you know, whoever processes the form will see that, um, you know, restaurant A violated the law. Now we have to tell them to get a wage bond and like we just keep going on about our business and it becomes a band-aid approach. Whereas if this committee is able to kind of look at where the problems are happening, they might be able to advise the, the city council, I'm sorry, your town council or other folks on other systemic ways that we can make changes to continue to, you know, boost economic development and also boost workers' rights in, in the city of Amherst. I think everybody benefits from that. So I think there's, you know, a very, a, a very large amount of benefits that could come from this, this group. Um, and I think also, just to speak to naming again, that these are laws, I think it's just important to keep reminding people that this isn't some radical thing that we're creating, we're just saying the basic laws that already exist on the books need to be enforced. So thank you. Um, uh, Dorothy. Okay, so I have a couple of questions too. Um, one, if a um, worker reports to this committee, will they be will it be confidential? Because um, when I worked as a waitress, when I complained, in which I did, that meant you had to quit. Um, and in the world right now, if you complain, um, most of the time you get fired, um, certainly by um, the, the government. Um, today I was startled. Somebody who complained about lack of appropriate PPE did not get fired. Mostly, if you complain, you get fired. So would somebody who came to you um, with a problem, would you be able to report that problem out without revealing the name of the person? Who can answer that? Whoever knows about these committees. Because I gather they, these committees exist in other places. Why don't we collect up all our questions in a row? I'm not even sure Evan was done with his questions. Uh, yes, we can go back to Evan. Um, uh, okay, we'll, we'll save that question um, and hopefully get an answer at the next meeting. Um, 
olası. I didn't want to take the opportunity away from Evan and Dorothy if they had more questions to list, which either could be answered at the end of our questions today or at a future time. I just thought getting all the questions out was better than three of us asking in a different way. Um, I don't agree. Um, I, get, I think it gets very lost and confusing, but okay, I have a lot more questions. When you talk about fair wage uh, with the contractors, uh, construction people, do you mean union wages or uh, not? Um, because I've been a little troubled by statements that um, when the town, that, that there's, there's like a dual standard, let's just put it that way, I won't go into detail. Um, also, I do like the idea of people certifying in writing that they haven't done things, but I'm, then I thought, okay, you check in their past history, what if somebody did in fact do things the old shoddy way, and now they are reformed and enlightened and want to do it right? Um, will the past history prevent them from new contracts? Is there some understanding of that? Um, also, I just am so used to how whenever we want to, to make somebody uh, follow a rule or a law, we find out they have 25 different names and every time you come after them in one name, they have another name. So I guess I'm, I'm having, I, I'm not sure that this will actually make people who break the law or shade the law behave. So I'd, I'd love response from people who know how this has worked in other towns. Because you're saying this is not new. This is how it works in many other towns. So I'd love to hear about that. Is that all your questions, Dorothy? Um, well, the last one is, I don't understand what you mean by the tax incentive, but I'm sure it will be revealed to me in time. Okay. Okay. Well, um, we have allotted just about 10 more minutes to this, but um, do we have other questions that we want to put on the list? Evan? Yeah, I did have a few more, although I was getting tired listening to myself talk. Um, so, and, and I did appreciate Rose's answer about um, why this committee should take complaints. I guess I'm still trying to figure out what, what it means for the committee to take a complaint. And if it's just they receive it and the, you said they don't investigate, so they receive it and then they send it to the AG. Um, is my understanding where they receive it and they send it to the town. So part of this is I'm, this is complicated and I'm just not completely understanding what happens when they get a complaint and what that looks like. And it also made me think back to some a lot of the training I have through the university of if a, if a student has complaints about certain things, you don't take the complaint, you just help direct them to the appropriate place and wondering if that's a more appropriate thing instead of, they say, we don't take complaints, but we are here as a resource to help you get your complaint um, and, and where that differentiation is. Beyond that, um, I was a little curious about, uh, I think it's section, D, I'm just gonna list the sections because I think that'll be easier for you all when you're looking at these. D2D, um, the, the, um, that they have to do a new notice of employment um, when there's a, it says change due to employees availability. Um, and I'm just sort of curious what that means. If that just, if that means, hey, over the next three weeks, I'm watching my niece, so I have to work less hours. Do they have to do a whole new change or is it sort of dramatic changes to availability, um, like going from a seasonal summer job to the to fall schedule or something like that. Um, E2, um, there was something that, that sounded a little bit like someone is guilty until proven innocent, which made me a little uncomfortable, is if they don't do this, they, we presume that they are violating the bylaw. Um, and I, I was sort of, it kind of struck me as just, well, that, why would we immediately assume they're violating the bylaw if they, if they didn't report something it felt, again, sort of this, you're guilty until you prove you're innocent thing. Um, I think at some point what would be useful to me to understand this, and again, this is just a comprehension, is sort of just walking me through if, if an employee has a complaint, if they feel like this bylaw is being violated, what that employee does and what the steps are actually to get from employee complaint to potential licensure revocation. Not that that would ever be written into the bylaw necessarily, but just um, to help me understand what this actually looks like when it's actualized, because this is honestly so far out of my wheelhouse that it's hard for me to actually envision what some of this looks like in practice. Um, G2, um, there was something about the, the um, committee can establish regulations, and I was a little bit curious about that. I know we have certain bodies that 
under mass general law can establish regulations like CONCOM or, or the BLC, but what it means for this if the committee's regulations they're establishing apply only to the operation of that committee or if they're actually regulations for the town, because um, I think those are two very different things, if it's their own body or actually regulations in the same way that are legally enforceable that we think of Board of License Commissioners. Um, that was it, and I will shut up for the rest of this discussion. Okay, um, I, I think that it does make sense not to uh, answer these questions right now because it looks like we have even more and um, that seems like it would be on the agenda for the next presentation. I think that was a good idea, Alyssa. And sorry, Dorothy. Um, um, but I do have another comment from Alyssa if that stand is, if that hand is still a valid one. I can't, we can't hear you. Go ahead. Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> Great. Um, yeah, I do have questions and maybe George does too. And so if we could finish getting all those questions together, then I'm sure, I'm sure they're working on an FAQ because they're so organized that I'm sure an FAQ is going to come out of this at some point. Um, so despite getting these documents, in fact, less than 48 hours ahead of time, because we didn't get them until 925 Saturday night, I don't want to slow this down. And I also don't want us to just pat ourselves on the back for saying the right thing. I want us to be doing the right thing. So along the lines of what Evan was talking about, how's this actually gonna work execution wise, understanding that of course you don't write all those kinds of details into the bylaw, but just so I can see how, you know, it's really actually gonna help people not just be something we have on our books that sounds good. One of the things that I think is pretty easy actually is when it comes to the TIF rather than the TIP, that the TIF bylaw, which as you know right now, is a couple, like basically a sentence long, which is how it's always been, just variation because of the change in the charter, is that I would say that just like it references the MGL, having it reference the other wage theft bylaw, I think is the way to go. I want the TIF to stand by itself, but yeah, don't have to repeat all that. Just reference the other bylaw, because after all, there are bylaws. We can write them how we want. Bob Ritchie has opinions about that, and they're still not all one way, even all the work we did revising them. Um, in terms of the bylaw itself, I also just want to say that while it was mentioned in the chart that it didn't have a purpose, we specifically said in our revised bylaws that bylaw preambles and statements of purpose are only retained if they're necessary to interpret the bylaw. So I'm not real eager to start going down the road of putting purposes at the beginning, but that's a minor thing. The other thing is, in terms of not slowing this down, I would love to see us go ahead and get this ready for town council now without the TIF part per se, except it could just be the TIF bylaw could reference the other bylaw and then that'd be fine with me. Um, and except I can't see including the wage theft advisory committee in any format. I'm still skeptical that the chamber wasn't asked about its participation before our first presentation to say that workers are concerned about very bureaucratic. I totally get that, been there, done that. And town meet town committee meetings are very bureaucratic. To pretend that they are not is not an accurate reflection of how this works. We've talked about the constraints of open meeting law in a couple of different ways. Like Dorothy said, how do you not get fired if you bring something up? So I'm wondering if the way to address that is two parts. One is to dump it out of this version of the bylaw and get going on making sure we have the other part because we are gonna start signing contracts with people. And so that would be good, not TIFs. We won't be doing those for a while, but contracts. And the other part is maybe looking at it as more of a model of a regional basis so that there's a committee with much with the same people but it's more like a quarterly thing or it can be every two months whatever like like various human service agencies already do and say we're seeing these issues in amherst we're seeing these issues in northampton these issues in hadley and having that insight across all those groups is really valuable and they could report out to each of the individual towns what they're seeing but we can't it's it's just that simple as i said two weeks ago we can't take complaints from workers at a committee that's written into the town bylaw. The town bylaw committee is going to have to be subject to open meeting law. We can't have an employee coming in and saying, my employer did X, Y, Z thing to me. That, that's just not going to work. So I'm saying look at a, a model that would still capture the reporting and capture the 
the focus on remaining organized and not losing sight of, oh, well, we put it on the books and now we guess it all just works out. I understand not wanting to just depend on the contracting authority, you know, the actual person who does the contracting who get, might get a complaint and making sure it gets to the Board of License Commissioners. I understand wanting to have a larger organizing presence around that, and I think that's a terrific idea. I just think it's not a town committee, so it doesn't belong in this bylaw because having it be a town committee subjects it to open meeting law, which is gonna prevent it from being of any use to any regular human who wants to actually complain about their situation. Okay, um, well, this committee has a lot of work to do before the next meeting. Um, Evan, do you have another? Is your hand still up? Yeah, I had written in my notes uh, G1 and G3, but not written what that meant, so I wasn't prepared to, to, to say the comment. So, um, the, and I promise this is the last one. So, G1 um, and G, not G3, GC, G5C, um, basically said that we can revoke licenses if they violate a part of this bylaw. And one, one thing that I was a little confused about is, and this may be my naive reading of it, or ignorant reading of it, was it, to me, the requirements of the bylaw, really the thing that the bylaw is imposing on employers are the posting and notification requirements. Like the bylaw doesn't actually say you have to pay wages and you have to get, give tips, right? I mean, that's all in, in state law. So the requirements of the bylaw are just posting stuff. And so when you were talking about all employers must follow the requirements, and then you were talking about the wage bond, and you were talking about the Board of License Commissioners, my reading of it was all if they violate the bylaw, but the bylaw itself is about posting stuff. And so I'm just curious if the intent was to say the Board of License Commissioners can revoke something if they don't post this notice, or or there can be a wage bond if they don't post these proper posters, or if the intent of it was if they are found in violation of uh, wage and tip law, then they, then they can have their license revoked. Because it, it wasn't clear to me, it kept saying the requirements of this bylaw, but the requirements of the bylaw are, are mostly notification, right? It's, and whereas the state law governs the other stuff. And so I, I was wondering if you intended it for that, or if I'm misreading it, or if it should have said something along the lines of, uh, violation of this bylaw or state law regarding wage and tips can result in these things. And so that was, that was the last thing. And I don't know if that's my reading or something. And now I'm actually done. Okay. Uh, George, do you have any questions or comments? No, they've been touched on and a, a number that I hadn't even thought of. So I'm fine. Okay, great. Um, well, I, um, I think that when you come back the next time, which will either be May 18th or the following meeting, um, depending on how much we have to do on May 18th, um, uh, hopefully we'll look forward to getting some answers and some uh, a flow chart of how it works. And um, we will have heard from the chamber and be set to move forward is my hope. Um, so thank you very much. Um, really appreciate all the work again that you, you put in and we'll, um, we will move on. So we're going to, and we're, we're pretty much right on schedule, amazingly. Um, so we're going to um, look at our review process. Um, we had we were referred to review process by CRC, and um, just um, just want to mention that with regard to um, prioritization of our agenda items, um, as for now, I'll just be working with the town manager um, regarding figuring out which items are time sensitive. So, and I would like your ideas as we go on, on how to review some of the larger issues that we will have in front of us, like the downtown parking working group study and the speed limits. Um, uh, but we have three new items on our, on our docket um, as of, or we're going to have as of the meeting today, uh, the town council meeting, we assume that these 
items will be referred to us, the Southeast Street Public Way request, the Farmer's Market Public Way request, and the proposed surveillance um, technology bylaw. And because the Farmer's Market request is tied to a goal of opening for Memorial Day weekend on May 23rd, we'll be taking that up on May 18th, and that will probably take up a fair amount of time. So um, before we have adopted our review guidance or review process, we do need to be doing a few one-offs, which is what we're doing, uh, in order to handle existing requests that are time sensitive and also um, like the wage theft issue that are, are connected in some way to COVID-19. So um, today we're not talking about prioritizing though. We're going to take a second look at po a possible review process or review guidance at least for this committee uh, about how to look at agenda items as they come up. So Meg Gage, who was the original presenter for the town meeting advisory committee of the proposal to create a review process um, looking at community impacts is here today and is just going to make a very brief statement about the reason for the original proposal. Um, and then we will look at the, uh, the TSO um, process proposal that we have in the, in the packet. So Meg, are you still here? I'm still here. Great. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. First of all, I want to thank you all and e express my uh, not only gratitude, but astonishment at how hard you're working through this hard time. And also, and particularly the town staff, I just have had new and the town manager have had numerous reasons to be in touch with various people on the town staff. And I've just really impressed with the professionalism and uh, showing up big time. So that's maybe the most important thing I have to say. But thanks to all of you, especially because you've really, uh, I just can't imagine how hard this has been and thank you. Um, I wanna make a brief statement in support of a process that helps a legislative body uh, think about things they didn't think of. Um, oftentimes legislative bodies like the council are dealing with a problem and sometimes in solving that problem there may be consequences that you didn't think of and I think the discussion you just had uh, on the uh, wages was a really good example everybody coming from pretty much the same place of wanting to do the right thing uh, but in the course of the conversation really good points were made about things that should be considered so that there weren't un unanticipated consequences uh, we often talk about the need uh, to remember the voice of specific populations that aren't uh, as experienced or vocal or powerful, uh, low-income communities and children, but there are other uh, uh, constituencies and groups that have an impact of policy that, ha that where there wasn't a mechanism to consider uh, unintended consequences. For example, specific neighborhoods, um, changes to a zoning bylaw about traffic development conservation can have a benefit or an impact on a particular neighborhood. Individual taxpayers, um, there's a wide range of incomes in Amherst and abilities to accommodate the rising property tax that we have to be sensitive to. Uh, the Amherst streetscape downtown, um, we, uh, we have to think about the impact of history, the balancing of history and a lively uh, economy as well as culture and the lives of citizens who want to go downtown. Public safety, um, beside the brilliant and uh, well-trained uh, police officers and firefighters, uh, legislation can have more indirect benefits and impacts on the safety of town residents. The town economy, uh, parking, public spaces, tourism, those decisions can have consequences the environment, of course, now we have the committee that is doing a lot of that, but also agriculture decisions made uh, to solve one problem can have a really uh, deleterious effect on agriculture. So I'm encouraging you to build all, I'm not it, all sorts of processes and the particular one that the committee is recommending is excellent, 
<clears throat> that allow you to think of the things you didn't think of. I don't know if you've had surgery ever, but they have this checklist thing now that everybody stops in the surgical office and they literally go through, did we think of this, did we think of that? Uh, my niece is a COVID nurse at, at UMass Worcester and there's, they change, have to totally change all their uh, equipment between pa pa uh, patients. And there's a nurse whose only job is to sit there and watch them do it to make sure they don't accidentally, unintentionally do something they didn't notice because they're so tired or whatever. So the problem with things you didn't think of is you didn't think of them. So any mechanism you can use to pause and think, what, what do we need to think about here? So when we're solving problems, which you're awesome at, we don't unintentionally create another. And the good thing about our council, one of the many good things is that you basically agree on what you want to achieve. There's like in the discussion you just had, there was no one who said, oh, this is a horrible idea. I wanna rip off workers. <laughs> It's really thinking it through. So thank you for the opportunity. May the fourth be with you, couldn't resist. Um, and I'll go back on mute. <laughs> I love May 4th, <laughs> I get to say that. <laughs> but thank you, this is really important. And I'm really grateful that you brought this back. I thought this was never gonna happen and um, our committee and those of us who worked on it last year for months uh, we don't care if it's our proposal or another one, but really we all appreciate and I'll be sure everybody hears about this, that you're taking this forward. Thank you. Thank you, Meg. I'll um, mute now. And I would uh, just say that, that uh, we need to thank the CRC, especially for, for taking it up and, and passing it uh, on to us. So if, um, uh, if you, Mandy Jo, could pull up the document entitled TSO Review Pro Process, um, that would be good. And this, when we looked at the CRC version of it last, at our last meeting, um, it was simply the CRC document and it wasn't in the form of a proposal uh, for the TSO. Um, so that is what this is. This is um, this is a proposal, and it's uh, it's very much uh, very 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 similar to the CRC proposal. And you'll notice that all every time it said CRC, it now says T TSO, and there were about a hundred of those. So, but I did do it all at the same time. You'll be happy to know I know how to do that. <laughs> Um, so, um, uh, both documents are based on, both the CRC and the TSO documents are based on that original uh, Town Meeting Advisory Committee proposal made last April that Meg was talking about. So numbers one and two here, uh, we looked at uh, last time, they were A and B the last time, um, and they are kind of represent the initial footwork uh, needed to be done to prepare agenda items for review. And then three is basically a uh, proposed review process. Um, so um, if we could just look through this, starting with number one, um, and we can see, we can read these together and see if we have consensus and whether, I mean, we don't necessarily have to adopt them today, but um, we can if we want to. So um, the first two are, again, just, just prep, prep for review. So um, number one, uh, if you just wanna read that to yourselves, um, about identifying the purpose of TSO review. Um, does anyone have any comments about it? Um, I'm trying to get Alyssa. Thank you. Um, 
obviously the wage and theft bylaw was a different animal and I'm excited to see it moving forward. And obviously we're in this bizarre headspace now with COVID-19, but as we adopt some sort of process, which you know may or may not be this process, which does just have CRC change to TSO, that first part, are we, who's, who is TSO when you reference TSO in that first statement? Because again, this was an exception, hopefully to the rule, but TSO didn't decide it was ready for a wage and theft presentation, no matter how many counselors wanted us to talk about it. We didn't decide that proactively. And so are we planning to do that in future when we're out of these bizarre circumstances, or is that a decision you're making in conjunction with the town manager? Who is it that is, who is meant by TSO in that first paragraph? Um, are, are you asking me as the proposer, Alyssa? Yes, I am. Um, uh, I am assuming that this is something that we ad would adopt for um, agenda items going forward. Um, and I'm assuming that right now in this, in this moment in time where we don't have a review process yet, that there are going to be a few items that come up that are just time sensitive that the either the town manager has asked us to do or in the in the in the um, in the case of the wage theft that was yes that was me being urged by other counselors that this was related to the COVID-19 uh, crisis and that gave it some urgency so yes yeah, so that was we clearly did not use this process to put that on the agenda and and that has been made very clear <laughs> um, uh, but this would be for um, going forward although i'm sure that there will be issues that come up on a regular basis that are simply time sensitive and may need to bump other issues for that reason um, so you know we may want to somehow add that into the process um, but this this process isn't about prioritization. This is just about how once we have something on our agenda, how we're going to review it. Um, do you have any response to that, Alyssa? Yeah, I guess I do. In that, how is it getting on our agenda in the first place? I mean, if we again, obviously we're not in normal times, but one would hope that normally we would be able to have a conversation at a TSO meeting saying, okay, we still have five things on our list that we need to work on. We've talked before about which are the highest priority ones, which are the ones we're going to talk about next time. Okay, if we're going to talk about issue A and B next time, what do we need to be prepared for circumstance A and B? Oh, A isn't going to be available? Well, then we'll have it the next meeting. If we don't decide that as a TSO group, then literally every time TSO walks into a meeting, we're going to have 48 hours notice of the fact that we're getting presentations on any number of things. And I just, I, I'm trying to avoid that and trying to avoid that frustration. And so um, I, I don't know why there would be time sensitive things that would have to come up for TSO review immediately because normally things would get referred to us by the council. So I guess I'm looking at a more strict interpretation of the TSO is deciding as a group what we're working on next. And so I understand that you're saying the prioritization is a different question than this question, but it's not in that you're saying once it's on the agenda, well, the only way it's gonna get on the agenda in my book is if we all agree that it's going on the agenda. Um, I think that you make good points. And I, I think that that should be a part of each um, meeting where we're talking about upcoming agendas, definitely. Um, but that doesn't mean that I won't then have a meeting with the town manager two days later where he says, oh, there's some other thing that's going to be referred and it's really time sensitive and that might need to bump some other issue that on, a, on an upcoming meeting. Um, so, uh, but it's something that we would need to, that would be a referral from the council. Um, so I'm, I, I agree with you, Alyssa, that we should make these decisions together um, and that the wage theft issue is, was a one-off. Um, so, uh, Dorothy, you have a comment? Yes. Um, yeah, I'm on mute. Good. 
So the first paragraph, clearly identify the purpose of the TSO review. Um, I thought I saw this document in earlier stages with much simpler language and, um, and, and fewer words. So I, I, and it was something that we at CRC kind of felt with a small sense of revelation with, that we wanted to know why, are we, why is this coming before us and what are we supposed to do with it? as opposed to ultimate response to the council should encompass. I, I just find those words take me away of, because we all said, yes, that's right. Why are we even looking at this? Are we supposed to pass it on? Are we supposed to do something? We somebody want feedback? What is our action? What action are we to take? And I, I think that that can't be stressed too often because so many things come our way. We can't keep up with it. Uh, we're on several committees. We have to have that really strong focus why are we seeing or listening to this today? And what are we supposed to do? And then I would even put in that same one, is there a time frame? Okay. And that would answer some of the things that you were just responding to, Darcy. Um, if that were clear, then we would have a, an easier way of knowing what we're supposed to do and reading it in a certain way. I mean, I read things differently depending upon what I'm supposed to do with it. Um, so that's my comment on this is to keep the language simpler, clearer and more focused as to what we're actually saying and make it read, you know, just get, get rid of all the bureaucraties as we can and, and make it very simple. Okay. Um, other comments, Evan? Yeah. So um, I think, and this might contradict, this might be in conflict with what Dorothy just said. Um, but one thing to me that's important um, is trying to um, say, why are we seeing this, but how does it relate to our charge in some way? Um, and so specifically being able to reference what aspect of our charge this relates to, because um, I think that would help us look at how we review things, which I think is sort of the next two steps. Um, one thing that I was struggling with when I was reading through the, uh, the wage step stuff that we just looked at is having served on GOL for uh, a year is it was very hard for me to not look at it with my GOL brain because I was looking at it and I was like, eh, this could be clarified and this is maybe a little inconsistent. And then I was like, wait, you're on TSO. TSO doesn't care about clarity, consistency, action ability. That's GOL. And so um, I, think, I think being clear on why we're looking at it in the context of our and what our charge expects us to look at um, is going to be important because for me as someone who served on GOL so was looking at it through my GOL lens and then who also serves on CRC and was looking at it and I was like well, how might this affect the economic activity of businesses and I'm like well that's really the CRC thing this is TSO when we really look at you know how it affects town services which in, in for the purpose of uh, the wage theft was really procurement and licensing. So really for wage theft, we should be looking at it from the lens of procurement and licensing, but it, it's hard to disassociate all of these things. And so I think the charge is maybe the starting document. Um, and maybe people, maybe we'll say we should look at all of those things um, because that makes it easier for GOL down the line if we tackle those things first. But I do think that's maybe a conversation we need to have. Okay, that, that actually makes a lot of sense to me to connect it more to the charge, but unless, unless we're making things more complicated than they need to be, um, you know, because this is pretty simple. Um, so other questions or comments? Um, do we have consensus on the general gist of number one? Is there anyone that objects to those ideas? Would be hard to object to those. Um, so <laughs> Sorry, can, I, can I speak here? Yes. Um, given what we just said, I really would like to, I would prefer this to be actually in bullets, not sentences. I, because uh, what, what Evan was just saying, okay, I could see that as being why the measures in front of TSO. Okay, um, I would just, I just think it's too many words, too many sentences. 
but we do want something that would focus. And we want a document that helps us focus quickly. Um, and so that would be, why is it before TSO? What are, what, what are we supposed to do with it? Maybe you can have some alternative you want there. Is there a time frame? Do we work with other committees on this? Or I mean, just um, if I'm going to use it, it's got to be simple. I, I am surrounded by paper. I have paper in piles, neatly put together, labeled all over my desk. The question is, where will I find that paper next time? Will I look at that paper? Will I read that paper? So I, I'm really for simplicity at this point. Okay. Yeah, the original uh, proposal that TMAC had was a lot simpler than this, the language. Yeah, this, this one. Um, yes. Um, so um, those are both good ideas. Um, so let's take a look at number two. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing that everybody agrees with the intent of number one, um, but that it could be connected to the charge and it could also be uh, more stated more succinctly. Um, okay, let's look at number two. Could you scroll down a little bit, Mandy Jo? Thank you. So um, this is all the same as what was proposed by CRC. Um, and it's just put forward to make sure that um, all the various relevant entities are contacted to make sure that, that we have all the information needed in order to go forward. Um, I added F. Um, so because there didn't seem to be anything including that in the others and that seemed like uh, an obvious common sense um, addition. And, and if you can see it appearing in anything else, please let me know. But I couldn't see it in A through E. Dorothy. Am I, am, I, am I muted? Yeah, I'm fine. Okay, my question is, who's going to do this? This is a lot of work, a lot of research. And I agree, it's good to do that. And it would be nice to do that. It's like, what is the past? What is the present? What is the future? And what has happened? And all of those things are great. But I'm thinking, okay, so who's going to do it? Um, we don't have a research arm. So that means that the, the, the committee does all of this work? Um, and and I'm, I'm beginning to feel a break with reality, okay? I mean, I totally agree with all these things, but I'm having a break with reality of how we can do this stuff. It's too much work. There's not enough time. And, and who even has access to all these documents? Where do we find this information? Who answers them? Um, I mean, if we had a meeting with, with a bunch of people there, I could just see having a meeting and saying, okay, who knows this? Who knows that? And then say, okay, get, send me a report and we'll put it together. Okay. That's a nice old fashioned way of doing it, but that's not really open to us now. So it's, it's, yes, it's a great idea and a great plan, but is it possible? Yeah. I think one question that we need to answer is, and I'm just answering Dorothy here is whether this document is um uh we would want to adopt as a hard and fast rules of how we operate or whether it's just guidance um so um that is a question for us because it may just be obviously we may not need to do all of these things for each measure that comes up on the agenda uh but it is a good as meg said a good checklist to see if we might maybe should be looking more deeply or, or finding out more about whatever the issue is. Evan. Yeah, I share Dorothy's <laughs> concern about workload, certainly. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking, um, you know, looking at this and thinking about this, um, and maybe this is complicating the document, which I know we're also trying to avoid, um, that 
to me, mentally, two should be split up into two different categories. So one is just identification of stakeholders. Right. Um, who are the people that we think will be impacted by this? And I think that really deserves its own section. And so we should be able to look at this and say, who are the stakeholders involved who would be invested in this? Um, because the purpose of that list is really, who do we as a committee potentially want to reach out to or even invite to a meeting to get their input? Um, which is a little bit different than information needed, although it's certainly related because part of the information we get from the stakeholders. Um, and then this, the second part of that is, um, I maybe label as context. Which is what's the broader con what are, what's the broader context that we're considering this in? Which is um, really E and F, which is what already exists, right. and then what are other towns doing? Um, and to me, if if we're dividing that two into sections two and three, one and two of this process would be things that would happen within the committee discussion. The committee would get together and say, who do we think are the stakeholders in this? That, that we might want to bring in. And then the context is, is really what Dorothy's getting at, which is this is a little bit harder. Who, who does that research? And which is another reason I kind of want to split it up because I think there's a differentiation between mm -hmm. committee. And, and part of me looking at this is thinking, is that we don't have staff, right? Which is Dorothy's point. But to some extent, that's information that staff would likely know Right. And so if we're looking at the responsible employer bylaw, I assume our procurement officer would have the answers to what regulations policies are already in effect that we need to follow. And so it wouldn't make sense to say, hey, George, go find all of the policies surrounding procurement that might impact responsible employer when Anthony Delaney could probably do it for us. Right. Um, and, and so that that's where. I think the context is, is trickier and where we get that information. Okay. I'm not totally clear, Evan, on, on, on what you're suggesting about how we would split up. Okay, I do, I know, I know what he's saying. Go ahead, Dorothy. Um, what he's saying is we had many meetings at CRC in which we would be there and um, staff would be invited. So if we were going to deal with um, the wage theft, Evan's suggestion would be that we, we, had, we certainly had some, some good uh, guidance from the uh, Pioneer Valley Workers Group, but that there also should be somebody from the town staff to say, well, this is how we do it, or we used to do it this way and we had problems, and or, or that's a great idea, but it would never work. I mean, you know, a, a, some practical voice uh, of somebody from, uh, from our side who would at least know what the town had been doing and how it had been working so that we're not just, you know, in a kind of an abstract environment. So I, I think that's, uh, I like his separation of, I, I, we could do the stakeholders, we could talk about it, we could then even divide up who would speak to whom or whatever. But when it comes to some of the research as to what is the history of practice in this town, I mean, we've got some, so we've got some resident experts on the committee. Alyssa can be counted on to give us background um, and which, uh, you know, as I say, I always appreciate, but also people in the staff who are doing it right now. I think that would be a good way to do it because I just don't see us writing papers. I mean, this is like going to college and having to do another paper. And um, we're here to think, respond and to act um, and not to spend all of our time in research. That's, at least that's not what I signed on for. Okay. All right, other comments? Um, yeah, I guess I, I feel a little bit like, um, you know, we have, we have a, a committee that looked at this and created, um, the CRC document that was forwarded to us. Um, they took the time to create it and, and now we're gonna take a whole lot more time uh, making it very complicated, uh, remaking the process that seems pretty, pretty common sense to me. But Evan. Uh, I'm not actually sure I agree with that. I think that, you know, if I'm envisioning how this could play out, 
Um, so taking the wage theft example, um, if we had been able to, to you know, um, go through a process first, you know, we would probably sit there and say, so why do we have wage theft in our pockets and what are we actually looking to do here? And as a committee, we discuss that and come to an agreement. And then we'd say, okay, cool. Who do we think we need to talk to for this? And so we, we'd obviously have said the sponsors, probably also Pioneer Valley Worker Center. But for instance, one of the people who I'm hoping will be invited to a future meeting on this is our procurement officer, right? I mean, this will affect procurement. Um, it'd be great to have their opinion because I don't actually know if the wage that sponsors talk to procurement, right? Um, and so it'd be nice to have, to have that conversation and then you invite them in and, and have a conversation with them. And that's gonna give us, I think, some of the information in E and F. Because if you're thinking about what's happening with the wage theft, um, I, I know Alyssa and I are very skeptical of this wage theft advisory committee. Um, and so what we were able to gather from having those stakeholders come in is they were said, oh, Lynn already has, Lynn, the town, not Lynn, our president, has this committee. Um, and here's how they structure it and what it does. And so we were actually, instead of saying, hey, George, go find out this information, we actually got the information about what other towns do from the stakeholders we invited in. So I think having the stakeholder conversation first and figuring out as a committee who we want to invite actually helps get us a lot of the information that's in ENF without us having to do that research. Because I know Dorothy doesn't want to do that research and neither do I because we don't have enough time. And yet there are people who have this expertise that could bring it to our committee if we're inviting the right people. I, I, uh, I hear you. And you know, the list under three gives uh, different different categories of um, stakeholder groups. So we might use that for that purpose. George? Yeah, I'm just uh, thinking about the kinds of things that are gonna be coming to us. Um, public ways requests, right? And those are sometimes gonna come with time pressure, um, probably, right? They'll have some kind of specific time stamp on them. Um, the farmer's market has a time stamp on it. And my sense is the sooner that gets done, the better. Um, I'm a little concerned about it coming to us a few days before people are hoping to open the market. But anyway, the point is that their public ways requests, their appointments, we're going to, and those again will are large, largely controlled by the, uh, the town manager and when he sends them to us, but they will have a certain time stamp on them. Um, and then their bylaws. And those are the kinds of things that, uh, like the wage theft, uh, the surveillance, this surveillance uh, bylaw that apparently is going to come our way. Those are going to take more time and are going to, I think, raise many of the questions that are on this sheet. I think the questions here are good. I hear the concern about too much words. I hear the concern about making it clearer. But many of these are, as Darcy's pointed out, are questions that uh, should be asked um, when we're dealing with uh, all these issues in a sense, but I think particularly with bylaws, this is where this is going to be useful. And that's gonna be a much more time, uh, it's gonna take much more time for us to work through that. So I think we, uh, maybe I'm missing something, but my sense is those are the three main areas we're gonna be working in, public ways requests, bylaws, and appointments. And this sheet seems to me largely to focus on when we're dealing with bylaws. Okay. And I hear also the idea that we're looking, I understand research and so on, we're not gonna be going out writing papers and so on but uh, take the wage theft. Um, many of the, the, the research has already been done. It's being brought to us by the sponsors and we bring questions and very good questions and then we get answers. And also we reach out perhaps to uh, stakeholders that haven't been uh, involved yet. Um, that seems appropriate. So um, I guess I'm not so much worried about uh, the, the issue of, of research and finding, you know, I think that we can work that out. Um, and I think this gives us a good framework for what we should be thinking about. I don't think it should be a step-by-step -step process. I think this is a guideline. This is a set of guidelines. It's my personal feeling. And um, I think we should keep those three main areas uh, that we're going to be dealing with in our minds in general. Um, and maybe I'm missing something. Somebody could add something that I'm missing. But I, basically, I sense it as public ways, requests, bylaws, and appointments. Mm -hmm. So George, are you saying that you are, um, um, you feel comfortable with this document in general 
as a gu as as guidance as opposed to step by step. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I think it's it's excellent for guidance. I mean, we can wordsmith it to death. I mean, I can sit down and, and, and write down a series of bullet points or a series of you know, questions, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, that might be a little bit clearer for me, and maybe eventually others would do the same, and we could finally come up with something we'll all agree on. But I think basically what we have here is fine. Um, it could be fine-tuned, um, but uh, you know, we need to get to work. And this gives us, I think, uh, us, us some the questions we should be asking are here, and clearly don't apply to all the things that we're going to be looking at, thank God. Um, but they certainly will apply to any bylaw that we are dealing with. Mm -hmm. Alyssa. Thank you. I was just going to volunteer if Dorothy didn't, because, you know, in all our copious free time to try and take a stab at more of a bullet point kind of approach, because I appreciate what George is saying about not trying to wordsmith it to death. I also, but I also want it to be kind of more of a checklist that I can race through rather than get bogged down in the sentences. I also want to point out that although I'm the first to point out that OCA's process is amazing and needs to be adopted by all the other town council committees as they move forward. This is a CRC process that was never actually used. So they wrote it and they didn't do anything with it. So obviously they did many of the things in it, but they didn't use it as a process. So we're not insulting their work by not using a thing they never used. Um, and obviously we have CRC members here who who know how they got to this point. And so I think that that's actually really helpful to us. The only other thing I got confused by is because just, you know, in the translation, as you said, you added one bullet point. Um, there's a reference in item 3B, which I know we are not at yet. And it was referencing something and I'm like, where is that going? And it's referencing back to, I guess it's 2BE. So, you know, we'll just fix that. But um, I think that, you know, trying to maybe simplify it a little bit, but then, you know, overall, I think it's just like the original conversation we had about this back when it was brought as a different kind of proposal. And before CRC tried to codify, which is that these are the kinds of things we'd like to be able to do, but to be able to approach it so that we're asking the right people, as people have already said, to the conversation so that we're not redoing other people's work or uh, you know, sending people off on wild goose chases when we haven't yet agreed as to what direction we're headed. Okay, thank you. Any other comments or questions about one and two? Um, uh, my, my inclination is to not discuss three today because we have 15 minutes left and we have a you know, we, we're going to talk about our upcoming agendas and minutes and other things that uh, minutes are a little bit more complicated than normal. Um, so uh, I, I am going to suggest we end our discussion, take it up again at the next meeting, um, be ready to talk about three um, and uh, yeah, just continue the, the general discussion about um, whether we want to adopt this as guidance or what, what we want to do. If, if we want to uh, somehow rewrite it um, or not. Um, my, my inclination is always to uh, not complicate matters, but um, uh, Evan? So uh, Alyssa had volunteered to try and take a stab at formatting one and two as bullet points. Or is that something that we want to see her do? I'd love to give Alyssa some work. Yeah, I, I thought that was a very nice offer. Um, so one and two, Alyssa, you suggested doing it for? Mike? It's unprintable. Yes, I could. It is. Yes, I could start there. <laughs> um, yeah, I think th three has a lot of um, information in parentheses that seems like it's um, necessary. So it's a little harder to do three. But if you want to take a crack at one and two, that's that seems like a great idea. Um, so. Yeah, that would be good. 
And um, so I think we'll just move on and take this up again at the next meeting. That's okay with everybody. Um, okay, I don't know if you all had a chance to look at the minutes, uh, but they um, uh, are, um, I, I made the initial track changes in them. Um, this is interesting because it's, we're abiding by rules that FYI, we did not abide by in OCA, <laughs> which, which are that the raw minutes, um, oh, are my track changes not here? I, I have a form that has every, just about everything crossed out. That's what I printed out. It's like, like almost all the minutes disappeared. Yeah, that, that might be the, the other set of minutes, not the one that's up here. But, um, so I, uh, I attempted to do some, editing of the very raw minutes um, and um, I think these are are these the oh April 6 okay so um, uh, well, the, the, the issue on the April 6 minutes is that I did the editing um, myself and uh, without track changes and then Athena informed me that I should not do that. Um, and with the April 21st minutes, I then attempted to use track changes, which I realized I do not know how to do. So I did a lot of strikeouts and you will see that it, it, it um, is, uh, doesn't look that good. So um, the question is whether we are prepared to approve these minutes or whether we want to, you know, like approve. It occurred to me that we could approve the, the first draft being made into a second draft so that it's more comprehensible for the, for the April 21st uh, minutes. Um, Darcy? Um, I'm not seeing minutes like this. Why are we supposed to have them with all this? this uh, in other committees, we don't get them. I mean, this seems like very annoying. And why did you have to cross out everything? I like minutes. I mean, if the minutes is just a, a, vote, a, a record of what was voted on, then they're very boring minutes and don't, are not useful in trying to remember what the heck went on. Um, my, mine, I have the, the one on the 21st. Everything is crossed out. And this one has all these little tracking changes, which I, I, why are they crossed out? Is it decided that they're not worthy to be in the minutes, all the details of what we did? Uh, it, uh, it is a long story, Dorothy, but mostly it's about um, that they just needed to be reformatted. The, the, tw uh, the um, April 21st was basically because Donna had not ever taken minutes before. And so that, that they needed to be reformatted. There were a different um, substantive um, statements that needed to be corrected. And so I can't, Athena informed me that I can't just go in there and, and, and uh, um, correct the raw minutes uh -huh. without track changes. So, yeah. um, if what we could do is just accept the track changes and then we would be able to see um, whether you accept that second draft. Um, we didn't actually ever deal with this in OCA because we just... Um, you, had, you, had, you had an experienced minute taker, I guess. Well, I guess we didn't. We all of this, all of this busy stuff on the side with your name and font and whatever and indent that is uh, really distracting. And right. I'm sorry that you had to spend so much work on it. Um, I guess 
if you're not allowed, I understand why you're not allowed to change the minutes because that would be tricky. Um, so I, I, I guess that if the, whoever took the minutes took the minutes, it wasn't us, that we should just have the minutes that they took. And if we wanted to add things afterwards, we could do that together. But I don't see how this forwards anything. Um, a lot of work. Alyssa and then George. Okay. So let's talk about rules for a second, not our town council rules, but rules that you referenced about minutes. When you said we didn't follow these rules at OCA, that's because we chose a different process at OCA. It isn't that we didn't follow the rules, it's that we chose a different process. I think our process is too cumbersome for this committee, uh, reflecting some of the things you guys have all already said. I also wanna make it very clear that it's not our fault, the person that was given minutes responsibility wasn't properly trained and that's unfortunate for her too because i'm sure it was frustrating for her that's not our job to train that person mm -hmm. the other thing is it is it is not in fact in any way true that it is illegal or inappropriate to change the raw minutes what that what the difference is is the raw minutes that they took are subject to public records requests we don't have to use those raw minutes we can look at those and go no, that's not what happened and write our own minutes or we can change them completely and we don't have to show track changes the raw minutes are always going to be subject to a public records request and can be requested and have the time period go by well before we ever have another meeting of tso and could have been released the way they are which is why it's such a tricky job to take minutes i would suggest that given the difficulty with track changes etc it may just make sense to have a variation of what we did at and continue we're doing at OCA where basically we just depended on the chair to say here's what I think the minutes look like do you see any egregious things that are missing here and we'd write back by a certain time just like we do for town council yeah so I, I don't know why we have to make this so complicated right right with you um is Athena on No, she's not. Raw minutes are a separate document than finished minutes. Right, right. You never change the raw, the raw minutes are never officially changed. They, they never get thrown away. Okay, okay. well, um, uh, <clears throat> does anyone have suggestions about where to go with these two sets of minutes? George, have a thought. Evan? I, I read through them. Um, I teach writing, so I'm very used to reading through track changes. Um, I, I thought they looked fine. The, literally, the, uh, I especially liked the part in the April 21st minutes where it said, Evan stated he was confused, which I hope is reproduced in a bunch of minutes across the town council. Um, the, I mean, literally the only thing is the, on our screen right now, uh, one called the order, link called the council meeting. Council is misspelled. But for the most part, it, I mean, the, it, I don't care if minutes are a little bit sloppy as long as they have the record of votes and they accurately describe the discussion. And so I, I would be fine accepting these track changes and approving both these sets of minutes. Aye, aye. Okay, is that a motion? Uh, uh, sure, I can move to approve mm -hmm. the minutes from April 21st and April 6th, 2020. I will second. Okay, um, all those in favor, Alyssa Brewer? Aye. Darcy Dumont, aye. Uh, Dorothy Pam? Aye. Evan Ross? Aye. George uh, Ryan? Yes. Okay. Wow. I'm glad we could get those approved. <laughs> um, and so I'll talk to Athena again about my ability to kind of um, uh, take the raw minutes and make them into ours, uh, our draft copy. So, okay. Um, now, announcements. I think that we need to speak for a moment about the possibility of having a meeting on the 11th. I would love to avoid that. Um, I think that we are going to, you know, we've seen the farmer's market um, request and um, all of the town, man the town manager's memo and 
we're going to get answers from him tonight at the town council meeting of all, all the questions that the counselors have sent in. There's some possibility that we will all feel very secure and good about the proposal going forward, in which case we could conceivably just have our, our meeting on the 18th. But if there are people here who think that we should still meet on the 11th, um, let, why don't we talk about that? Oh, I'm very happy. Nobody wants to meet on the 11th. <laughs> no one? Oh, George. Just help me. Um, is the 11th strict B to deal with the farmer's market? Yes, it would be. And basically, um, we, we went through a number of possibilities of how we could deal with the timing in case the farmer's market needed to come back with an amended proposal. But if, if we have discussion and questions tonight at the council meeting, then that will be an opportunity for the farmer's market to come back with an amended proposal to our meeting on the 18th. Um, so that was the that was the issue is that did we need to have a presentation and meeting from the farmers market that would allow for another um, for an amendment a period of time where they could amend their proposal or you know if they saw that there were concerns from the counselors tonight about a couple things they could come back with a an amended proposal. Um, they just are concerned about starting on the 23rd. One question that hasn't been answered is, are they, is it, is it clear that the farmer's market will be ready to provide all those accommodations by the 23rd? I asked that of the town manager and hopefully there'll be some answer to that tonight. But um, so, uh, the question is, do we need to scramble in order to make sure they can start on the 23rd? Um, Alyssa? I think the answer is we won't know the answer until after tonight's meeting. I right. think once we see tonight what kinds of questions the counselors have and, and if, I don't even know if someone's scheduled to be there from the farmer's market to answer those or not. Um, and if most of those feel like they can get answered, then I would actually argue, strangely, perhaps sounding at first, that we should in fact meet on the 11th, I know grown, because we already have other meetings that day, just about this, because I would want it to go to the council on the 11th. I don't want to, nothing's, I can't imagine what's gonna change between the 4th and the 18th that can't change between the 4th and the 11th if the 23rd is important to them. So it feels like we're stretching it out too long. You know, I mean, it's theoretically possible, as you mentioned, Darcy, that we could, that the town council could approve because all the questions have been answered tonight. It seems a little unlikely that'll happen since, you know, people's first chance to get their questions answered. But I'm not seeing what value we add to wait between tonight's meeting and then not talk about it at TSO until the 18th. How does that help the farmer's market be ready for the 23rd? That's my concern. And so what I'd actually rather do is hope that tonight we get enough good information that we can say, you can say to Paul, okay, these are the questions we still have. They can be answered on the 11th at just a purpose for that for an hour, hopefully no more. And then we can recommend to the council that night, the 11th. Yep, it's good to go. Other, uh, Dorothy? I, I agree with Alyssa. I mean, the farmers are ready to go. The, um, I forget what it is, the special SNAP benefits. Uh, if you use fresh food, people need those. Uh, we really want this market to get started. And um, I just think that we'll know tonight whether we need to meet on uh, Monday the 11th. And if we do, we should get the thing, to, we should just finish up all the details on the farmer's market so that they that gives them a better chance to get themselves ready for the 23rd. The, the question in my mind is, what uh, can we do on the 11th that we couldn't do on the 18th? I, I just feel it's better not to drag it out because it, we don't know what's happening. 
uh, work ahead of time, be proactive, don't be reactive, and just make sure that it goes forward. Um, if, if somebody can't be at the meeting, um, how many, what is the minimum number of people that need to be at a meeting? Three. Three? Uh, I would say, because I mean, listen, people have things that happen in life and sometimes they can't make a meeting. I understand that. Um, if, three, if three people, I can be here on the 11th. If three people can do it, um, I'm sure it's not gonna be earth shaking. It might be just something procedural. We can do it and then it's done. And then if something else pops up, then we'll deal with it. I mean, I think we have to be, this is a big thing in terms of our committee function, this is a big thing. So I wanna make sure that we do whatever we have to do to make it go, help it go forward. George. What time on the 11th? It would be right after our OCA meeting. Okay, I can live with that. That's 11.30, just to clarify? Yes. Okay. Because on the 18th, I have down 9.30 or 11.30. Uh, no, 9.30 is the OCA meeting. And the 18th, too. And 8 o'clock is my community choice aggregation meeting. You're so. talking about the 18th? 11th. The 11th. Um, we're mixing up the two dates. Uh, we're meeting on the 18th no matter what, right? Oh, right. The TSO, yeah. because we're talking about wage theft and whatever else. Yeah. The 11th is simply to get the farmer's market done because otherwise the farmer's market is basically sitting there twiddling their thumbs going, what's TSO going to say two weeks from now? I, yeah. I don't know why we would want to do that to them. Okay. So, but on the 18th, I'm just asking, I have down two times, which time is the time we would meet on the 18th? 9.30 um, or 11.30? 11.30. 11.30, okay. They're both 11.30. They're both... Okay. That's all I need. That's good. I just had to get my book straight. Okay. All right. The 11th. 9.30 on June 1st. Is that not true? Wait a minute. Isn't the 18th? Oh, the 18th, you else? You, you're on mute, Evan. Uh, the 18th is 9.30. Oh, right. Yeah. 18th. It would just be this one. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. That's what I need. I wanted to get that straight. And Evan, can you make it on the 11th? If we need to, as long as it's a really short meeting, just because I have stuff in the early afternoon, that was my only sort of break in the day. But. Yeah. Well, there might be presentations by the farmer's market. There might be presentation by Julie Fetterman, um, town staff. I'm assuming that that's what's going to happen at whatever meeting is the big farmer's market meeting. So. Um, Anyway, okay, well, good to know that you're all on board with having a meeting the 11th. I guess, um, let's mm -hmm. see how it would, goes today. Would the meeting on the 18th then? That's a question. Pardon? Or would the meeting on the 18th, is the meeting on the 18th gonna happen no matter what, or is it one that we would have if we needed to have it? Well, we set that meeting up to, um, um, our, I mean, we, populated that meeting with the uh, appointments. On the 18th. Although, although it might be a fairly quick, uh, I mean, if we're getting a, a bulk request for reappointments, that might not take that much time. I don't know. I don't know exactly how we're going to arrange that. Um, but um, so as of right now, it does seem like we need the meeting on the 18th. Um, so, um, uh, Alyssa. Yeah, I was just going to say that we just told the wage theft people we were going to be talking about it again on the 18th. So the 18th was already on our schedule as something we were going to do. That's why we were loath to add in the 11th because we were trying to not do that. But again, the reason to not do it, as we've said, is so the farmer's market has some direction. I personally am hoping that enough questions get answered tonight at town council that we don't have to have a presentation by the farmer's market and we don't have to have a presentation by Julie Fetterman, that they're only there if we have questions because we don't really have time for presentations and starting this late in the season, those presentations should be made at town council tonight, not at TSO. Mm -hmm. yeah, I don't think they're on the agenda for tonight though. Um, that's so, not our fault. Right. So let's, um, uh, do we agree that we should wait until after the meeting tonight to make a final decision about the 11th? I'm, I'm leaning in that direction myself, George. 
Okay, I see nods. Um, all right, so and then so sometime before um, Wednesday, uh, I'll um, we'll we'll make a decision about the the eleventh. That's your call, Darcy. Uh, That's Darcy's call. Well, thank you for giving me that power, George. <laughs> You're the chair. I apologize. I have a quick question. It's my confusion. The meeting on the 18th is at 9.30? 30? 9.30, 30, yes. I have OCA at 9.30, but that's probably an ancient, uh, okay. So 9.30, TSO, the 18th. Thank you. Right. There's is OCA on the 11th. Yeah. Um, okay. So um, uh, the... So we already talked about the agenda at the next meeting. We did say to the wage theft people that they will either be on the 18th or the following meeting, depending on whether, because uh, you know, I, I thought we might be doing the farmer's market on the 18th. Um, so that, you know, that that is movable if necessary. Um, so any items not anticipated by the chair to 48 hours in advance? That's mine, no, there are none. Uh, any other comments before we adjourn? I have a comment. I just wanna thank Alyssa for re making the clarification between raw minutes, that was useful. No. Any other comments? All right, uh, the meeting is adjourned at 11.38 a.m. And I will chime in to formally adjourn the council meeting. Oh, yes. At 11.39 a.m. <laughs> Thank you, Mandy Joe. Thank you very much, Mandy Joe, for, for sitting through this and being our producer today. Very much appreciated. You're welcome. All right. Thank you. And to you tonight. Oh, yeah. Oh, boy. Okay. <laughs>